Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chaitali Bag from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. In a run up to India's Republic Day, Aviation and Defense Universe is brainstorming the Northeast of India, its challenges of not only sharing borders with China, Myanmar and Bangladesh, but also of insurgency from within. And we have with us Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia and Lieutenant General Shaukin Chahan to speak with ADU on the military challenges of the Northeast. Both the generals have unbelievable experience of having served in the Northeast in various stages of their army career. And the conversation promises to be most enlightening and absorbing. We have the editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, Sangeeta Saxena, to take the discussion forward. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the ADU chat room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atali. And uh, great welcome to both of you, sirs. General Bhatia and General Shokin Chauhan is just wonderful. You know, it's very rarely that we have two people of such great stature. And today when we are here in a run up to the uh, Indian Republic Day, our topic for the day is something which is very close to your hearts and our hearts, the Northeast of the region. And uh, as always, we'll begin with the senior sitting here. So General Bhatia, we begin with you. Our first question with General Vinod Bhatia, who was, for everybody's information, yes, DGMO, yes, DG Infantry, but also core commander of the 33 Corps. And uh, I'm sure he saw everything very closely from there. And of course, he has the privilege of having commanded a battalion in the Northeast. Sir, how is it to be in Northeast as an army, uh, you know, Corps commander? How was it to have been as a uh, as a commander of your regiment, of your battalion? And uh, do you think it really worked wonders for your thought process in China, which is currently just the other side uh, of the country? Uh, thank you, ADU. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you, Chaitali. Uh, well, North is, is, uh, you know, is a mystery to many. Uh, and uh, you know, in the earlier year, we used to call it part of the forgotten force. Anyone who crossed the Brahmaputra was part of the forgotten force, and it was believed uh, that you had to cross the Brahmaputra seven times. You know, air travel was not so common, not so common. It was uncommon actually, very rare. And uh, you had to cross the Brahmaputra seven times once you are posted. There was a part of the forgotten force. But things have changed, uh, and I think uh, Northeast is, uh, is is very beautiful. Let me just try to put in context for North. I'll take a minute to talk. About that. No, uh, when you talk about Northeast, we generally believe that Northeast Seven Sisters. No, it is not so. Northeast is uh, what I call Northeast, it crosses the Siliguri border, the 24 kilometer wide Siliguri border. It comprises of eight and a half states. Uh, that includes uh, the Seven Sisters, Sikkim, and uh, North Bengal. Uh, it is 5.5 crore people. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it, you know, it's a peculiar set of contradictions, that you, if you ask me. Uh, little understood by many, uh, by most rather. It is complex, it is complicated, a few common threads, some converges, and many conflicts. It is located on the wrong side of the 22 kilometer wide silver border. It's the only land connected to the rest of India. So the Northeast region is definitely the eight and a half states. Right? What are the people? People are most important, actually. It's people centric. And, and the people, are, uh, uh, I think, the, one of the best people I have known uh, in any any of, uh, you know, Indians are, are very good people in any case, but world over, people are always very, very good. But Northeast the people are different. There are people who are relatively happy, though deprived of development, people rich in culture, a people with values and beliefs, a proud people, a people who laugh at anything and everything. You'll find them laughing at anything and everything. They fall down and still get up laughing. A people who know no boundaries, whether these are interstate or intrastate. A people where tribe is an identity and survival is a constant battle. A most honest people comfortable with the most corrupt system. A people who have many virtues and some vices, who love the guitar and admire the gun. Unfortunately, these are the same people who cannot live with the idea of India and also cannot live without the idea of India and hence have taken to the gun in a mis misconceived notion of sovereignty and autonomy. A misconceived notion of territorial rights and a fueled, supported, sustained insurgencies and separatist movements aiding and abetting terrorism. People are the center of gravity. Northeast also is the state shares over 40% of India's 15,106 kilometers of land borders. So it is very important both 
for internal security and more importantly, as it shares borders with five of the seven nations, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar. So it, that is what, uh, you know, uh, when we talk of Northeast, we should understand Northeast. And of course, we've had uh, the insurgencies, uh, well, the first insurgency, the Naga insurgency. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Mizo insurgency uh, in the 80s, it was 15th August, uh, now, you know, Republic Day, but Independence Day, 15th August 1985, where we resolved, particularly resolved, the Mizo insurgency. And in the mid 80s, there were 120 known insurgencies the world over, known technical insurgencies. And Mizo insurgency, fortunately for us, was a second insurgency to find a resolution. The first being the Malay insurgency. So we have to give credit to India, the idea of India, where we resolved an insurgency in 1985. And today, if you ask me, and uh, Jan Shukin Chuan is, of course, uh, uh, his knowledge and his know how is much better than mine. And he's totally you know, up, up to date on these things. But I feel that uh, as of today, uh, Northeast uh, is a very good connect. The people are absolutely uh, for India. Uh, the insurgencies uh, are really not there. So it's more of an industry. And uh, they support the idea of India. Uh, that's my, my, my feeling. And I'll, I'll come to in the later half when I, I can give you the figures of the oldest levels in the Northeast states. And also, if you look at uh, our border people, they have supported uh, the Indian Armed Forces, the Indian Army, uh, in sustaining uh, us in those very high altitude areas, in the border areas, especially in Arunachal, in Sikkim. Uh, we cannot sustain there without our uh, uh, without the support of our people. And these people who are the inhabitants of the border areas, especially in Arunachal and Sikkim, I think they are very hardy, very steady. They are always there to help out the army. They come with the animals, the yaks, and uh, and they do. Uh, they, they are willing supporters, and it is their support that we sustain, survive, and we have the staying power courtesy them. That was just wonderful, sir. Absolutely. So it gives us a very uh, nice and very comprehensive background of the Northeast. And uh, so, from you, we go ahead to uh, General Shaukin who has, you know, like you said, you know, you cross a Brahmaputra once and you cross it seven times. And uh, Jal Shaukin has had continuous tenures at uh, the junior and the middle level. And uh, Jal Shaukin, what was it like? How was it different from the other parts of the country? How did you find it different? Jal Bhatia just told us how he found it different. We'd really like to know from you, that with all your tenures in the Northeast, we'll talk of your tenures at the senior level too, which have been right up to the DG of Assam Rifles, which is very important. And uh, But we like you to, of course, uh, tell us about all your tenures and how it was to be there in the Northeast. Uh, good evening, Sangeeta. Uh, good evening. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Indeed, a privilege to be speaking uh, in the same forum uh, with Jan Bhatia. Uh, please well known with the DGMO and uh, extremely erudite about so many issues that uh, I have been in my career uh, largely ignorant of. Uh, Sangeeta, you know, I, I went to the Northeast from, from Kashmir. I was a company commander in Kashmir uh, in Uri. And uh, after tenure uh, at the National Defense Academy, as, a, as an instructor, I was uh, posted uh, to my, my unit moved to the Northeast uh, Manipur, Ukrul district, which was the hotbed of insurgency. I'm talking 1988. And when you go there, you tend to put a frame of the problems in Kashmir and put it onto what was happening in the Northeast. So that was the first lesson that we had to unlearn that uh, the Northeast or Manipur and Nagaland were not Kashmir. It was not state-sponsored terrorism. It was an insurgency of the people. If it was sponsored, it was sponsored at the earlier times by China. But in the time that I went in 1988, uh, China had sort of moved out. The Mizo Accord had been signed. And unfortunately, just a couple of months before, uh, after the Oinam incident that happened in a village called Oinam in Manipur, where uh, the NSC and I am raided a uh, SAM rifle post. 
So when I reached, it was everything was on an edge. Uh, people were very careful. Uh, we were we were walking in the darkness because we didn't know what really how to really deal with the insurgents. These were our people, but at the same time, uh, they had hit a post, and it you know it it was a big problem. But what Jal Bhatia says actually is is so true. They're such wonderful people. They they had these broad smiles. Uh, you know, we were I was a post commander in in a village called. Uh, Lower Lyshen, and then moved uh, moved to another village called Kachai, in a cruel district. Hotbeds of insurgency. The villages of uh, of of the famous insurgent Ram Kathing and uh, Livingston. Uh, so when I reached there, uh, I I really felt that there was something seriously wrong. Uh, uh, why were we fighting these wonderful people, and why were they fighting us, and what was their idea about? Uh, about living, as General Bhatia says, in a world where they thought that they would actually be, you know, they could survive as independent nations, which obviously they can't. So it's 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 a place where they, they you know, if you visited their churches and you attended their, their functions, they had such beautiful voices. They were so talented, wonderful sportsmen, uh, wonderful wonderful people who welcomed you to their hearts. But at the same time, uh, extremely capable fighters. And uh, if we were hit, and we were hit once or twice by them, we simply did not get to know who hit us and how they hit us. They hit us and went before we even realized we've been hit and we've lost a couple of people. So there's a lot under the surface in the Northeast, which, which uh, we must learn about. And uh, the obvious force, the, the force that the Indian Army or the Assam Rifle uses has to be tempered by the fact that these are people of our own country. And uh, if they're fighting for something due to bad governance or due to lack of uh, uh, communication, then we should in improve the governance and improve the communication, and improve the other facilities before we actually start blaming them for looking beyond India. Right, the, that's a lovely thought, actually. That's a thought which, uh, you know, very rarely comes into anybody's minds, but it it's a very nice thought. Jan uh, uh, Bhatia, uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, ask you how difficult or how easy is it, uh, you know, to keep China at bay in that region? Now, uh... Uh, Sangeet, that's the uh, you know that's the challenge when you when you say China, China remains a primary challenge, and uh, when we talk of the Northeast, unfortunately, uh, for some reasons you know we had a, a, a misconception. We did not uh, go in for infrastructure development. We didn't go in for the roads in 2005, and uh, if you look at it uh, over the years, we just had a couple of bridges on the Brahmaputra. So we are very vulnerable there. We also have a narrow silicon corridor. The strategic importance of silicon corridor has to be understood with the we China because China uh, can also, uh, you know, we, we also have to cater for the third country option where China can, you know, use Eastern Nepal uh, or through Bhutan through the, you know, what we call the you now popular you know, Doklam, which is actually Doklam Plateau, uh, or even through uh, Myanmar in the northeast through Kibutu. So that is where I think uh, the challenge lies. Uh, but the fact remains that for uh, four and four decades plus, uh, we have ensured uh, peace and tranquility. Fortunately, the infrastructure didn't come up, but it's coming up now. In 2005, 73 roads were sanctioned, which is known as ICBR, the China Border Roads. Uh, but uh, they did not come up until they were to come up in 2012. Unfortunately, 16 out of the 73 were constructed in 2012. And then I was a DGM at that time, we pushed it to 2019. And uh, Fortunately for us, what China has done in 2020, the forward deployment along the LAC Eastern Ladakh has woken us up and we have now given it uh, the requisite push, the requisite focus, the requisite resources. Uh, so, uh, what? Uh, yes, a little late, but it's been done now. So, the challenge with, uh, in Arunachal actually lies, uh, we have to understand that China claims uh, 70,000 square kilometers of uh, our territories in Arunachal, which, which it causes South Tibet. Uh, but there was a time when uh, Mao Zedong, you know, who had a philosophy of having internal land borders, his philosophy of having internal land borders, right? he did not say maritime borders, whether designed or default, well, that uh, uh, number of strategies differ on that. 
but his uh, philosophy in terms of land borders. So accordingly, uh, China has resolved the land border, 12 out of the 40 nations, the two being uh, India and Bhutan, and India and Bhutan linked because of the trijunction both in the east and west of Bhutan are linked, the trijunction between India, China, Bhutan. So there are linkages to that. So uh, what we need to do uh, with China is, uh, you know, build relative strengths. I'm not talking. We, we have a dissuasive defensive posture there. And we have done well. We have uh, we went into raising of two additional divisions in 2009-2010. Uh, so we have uh, defense-wise, I think we are well off. Uh, we can defend our territories, uh, and China knows that. We have an ambitious deployment. We have, we, if you look at it, uh, we we have uh, uh, divisions deployed all along, flight from Kibbutz to Karakoram. We have uh, you know the cores there. So it is that we are weak. We don't we don't have weakness. It is that our wave of defense. Uh, is what deters China, and that is what I keep saying. If we do not defend the LAC uh, against aggressive, uh, China's aggressiveness, then other things will not fall into place. All other strategies which we have, uh, like dominate, domination of the seas, trying to balance like port and all, is contingent to our standing firm along the LAC. Because if you are not firm out there, the other things will not uh, be, be a deterrence. So defense of the LAC is uh, imperative, and our natural like Eastern Ladakh uh, is also, uh, 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 we should face that it's a threatened area and we kept, we have to continue to build capabilities, enhance capacities and especially infrastructure and that will also help out our people. Our people, they, they need roads basically because roads will give them education, roads will give them health, communication, tourism. I still don't, I, I don't know where Madhya Shukhi is only a better place to say. I, I still don't understand why we still have the ILP, the inner line permits. Uh, we should well, we should encourage tourism. We should encourage people going in. It will help the economy. Uh, we, we have to understand that you know China is building section thirty villages uh, on their side of the line of actual control of the uh, India-China border. So what does section thirty villages mean? It means if you go with 1996 uh, treaty, it says categorically that uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, uh, popul the inhabited areas will not be disturbed, right? There is a 96 treaty between India and China. Of course, China violated the treaty. I'm not saying that they have violated, but there is a treaty in place which has not been, you know, uh, which has not been revoked. So we also have to understand that we have to build villages. We have to encourage our people. Most of our people now migrating from there because there's, there's no health health out there, there's no infrastructure, there's no education, uh, uh, the employment is not there, other than the armed forces, the army especially. So we'll have to look after Arunachal in a big way. Sikkim, I think, is uh, I was a proponent of Sikkim. Sikkim is much, we we, we are uh, much better than uh, Sikkim. Of course, we st still need more roads. Uh, Sikkim is, uh, again, uh, a territory which uh, China eyes. And uh, we, are, we are fully prepared. I think Arunachal and Sikkim, both is, uh, and both is uh, along the 1146 kilometer of Arunachal border. And uh, uh, Sikkim, I think we are well prepared. Unfortunately, for many years, we should you know, call it we used to have West, uh, Western sector, which is a common sector, and then we said rest of national with the RALP. No, no, the, the psychology was such RALP. Uh, I remember as, as uh, the DGM let me know, I'm sorry for using this word I, but I said, what is RALP? I don't understand what is RALP, but it's a natural Pradesh. Why should I call it rest of natural Pradesh? Because when I start calling it rest of natural Pradesh, mentally, psychologically, I have already, you know, said it is rest of it, it is not really pri my priority area. Whereas if you look at it after many years, three core was raised and it is, it is now uh, our priority areas. So that is how we went on the raising of the divisions. We went into the raising of the accretion forces. It's not mountain strike core, accretion forces. And they were sanctioned on 13th or 17th of July. And it is accretion force, 90,274 men. It is not mountain strike core. It is much more. It is armored brigades, infantry brigades, engineer elements, artillery elements, services, uh, you know, general support logistics units. What you need for survival and uh, you know fighting in altitude. So I think we are uh, we are well prepared at Arunachal. We are up to it, uh, and we can face uh, any threat uh, with the uh, our military might there. We are, we can we have a resolve, and we have the experience, and the expertise. I, I think that's very positive to hear that, sir. It's just wonderful. And Jill Shokin, the uh, continuing from where Jan Bhatia has left off. Uh, what about the Myanmar border state? How okay. how are they how are they placed, and uh, how safe are we there? Uh, let me just take you on a small geography trip to the Myanmar border. Uh, 
the northernmost state that faces Myanmar is Arunachal. So the complete eastern border of Arunachal is with Myanmar till the tri junction and 120 or 126 kilometers from the tri junction down south is undemarcated borders with the Myanmar because Myanmar has said that you sort out this problem with China and once you sort it out, you can sort it out with us. But the balance of the 1,676 kilometers are uh, that is along the northernmost state of Arunachal. Then you come south of Arunachal is Nagaland. The complete state of Nagaland, the easternmost border is, is, it, uh, is with Myanmar. Then you come further south, you have Manipur. Uh, once again, the complete state of Manipur is with uh, Myanmar. And from there, you come southward uh, to uh, the state of Mizoram, where the eastern borders of Mizoram are with, uh, uh, are with Myanmar, and the southern and western uh, borders are with Bangladesh. So it's 1,676 kilometers. The num amount of fencing we, we've got is only 1.2 kilometers of fencing. That too, uh, one kilometer north and about two, 200 yards south uh, from the uh, More, which is the border town, that part has been fenced. And after that, the fencing project didn't take off and it, it can't take off. Along the Myanmar border, we also have the uh, a very peculiar uh, protocol called the free move regime. That means 15 kilometers uh, on either side of the border is uh, our, our villages which were divided by this border because the same uh, the same tribes stay on both sides. So 16 kilometers on both sides, they, we, we call it free move. People are allowed to carry head loads and trade with each other without the need of a visa. And they are not stopped. So if you put this into mind and, and it's an open border with uh, tribes living on both sides, you realize how difficult it is to police it or manage it because people are crossing all the time. Uh, none of them have uh, identity cards. Uh, we, we can't identify uh, whether a person belongs to India or Myanmar, especially across the IMD, that is the Indo-Myanmar border. The Assam Rifles has a total of 46 units at present, Sangeeta. And uh, out of these uh, 46 units, 19 units are on along the Indo-Myanmar border. But even along these uh, Indo-Myanmar border, only half of the 19 units are on the border itself. The balance we have about, say, uh, maybe five to 10 kilometers behind wherever there is territory that we can hold and which is dominating enough to look at both the hinterland to deal with the insurgency in, inside and to deal with the illegal crossings, the illegal smuggling, the drugs, etc. So all in all, you actually have less than 11 to 12 units that are on the Indo-Myanmar border. So 1,676 kilometers, you divide by 10 or 12, you come to a rough listing of, of 16 kilometers per, per unit, uh, which, is, which is an impossible area to police, especially when there are rivers, there are ravines, there are jungles, extremely bad terrain and extremely bad communication within. There are no roads between one post and the other. Uh, you have to walk. Some of these patrolling would take us up to five to six days to even reach the units that are in the southernmost tip of uh, Mizoram. And General Bhatia will agree with me. Uh, actually, have to walk something like 15 to 16 days uh, to go on the patrol. So there are patrols which are 15 to 16 days in this day and age where there are no roads at all. If you're going to cross from BP1 onwards and go up to BP8, 10, 20, you will find that these problems are there. Uh, so no, regardless of any force that is selected to border or manage this border, it is an extremely difficult situation. Now, across the IMB, you have 55 uh, to 60 uh, uh, camps of these insurgent groups which are across. Some of these insurgent groups have strengths of over 100, 200. The NSC and IM has strength of 4,000 guards. They are, have access to modern weapons, extremely sophisticated weapons, sophisticated equipment. And uh, the normal police force or the normal way of 
you of protecting the border that is what the bsf uh, the bsf does in the other borders uh, you know holding it with border posts which are about 10 to 14 people have simply no survivability also what doesn't have survivability is the local police so there is no police existence in the local border villages uh, because if they were to have a post of five people or ten people in one village, they would get wiped out by the insurgents, which is the reason why the Assam Rifles has to function. So while the Indo-Myanmar border is an undisputed border, there is no problem with Myanmar. The problem is this illegal crossing that goes on. The problem is the camps that are on, on the Myanmar side. The problem is the access that the insurgents have of sophisticated equipment and sophisticated weapons and the kind of equipment and weapons that they use they, and they, on us or on any force that would want to you know, stand in their way. So they, they, that's the issue about the security of the border. At the same time, it has been uh, you know, an, a success story. We have caught a large number of narcotics over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, narcotics, illegal drug, drug running, illegal gun running, uh, movement of people, illegal wildlife smuggling, uh, you name it, uh, and that, that happens in the Northeast, uh, Northeast border with, with Myanmar. Now, there was another question that you asked about China, and how does China come into this cauldron? So, till 1966, 67, maybe 70, 71, uh, Chinese were giving full help to the to these Naga groups. And to, uh, you know, and that was without, they didn't have the cloak of uh, deniability and they didn't bother to deny their uh, connection with them. But from 76 or 78 onwards, after they started the situation of, of uh, Deng Xiaoping coming in and uh, they, they started reducing their support to the in Naga groups. And similarly, uh, then, you know, uh, if they did something, it would be with a great deal of deniability. So as a result, what happens is, Sangeeta, you, we, we are still nebulous about the support of China. Uh, this recent ambush uh, done on country party uh, by the PLA could or may not have been with China's help. Uh, you know, maybe China has said this, maybe they haven't. But all in all, it's a dangerous situation. China is in a place, uh, you know, the last point is Yunnan. Uh, there's a village called Rudi. That's where China's last point is. They have a grey market weapons there. Uh, and from Yunnan down to the, the, the Somra tracks and on to our borders, just about 167 to about 200 odd kilometers. The Japanese, as you know, in World War II, crossed it very easily, came across and came through the Northeast. So uh, China can do it too. So, and the border is fairly, uh, well, well, not really protected. But at the same time, we've not had a problem. We've not had a problem uh, with the Myanmar army. We, we work with them. We function with them. We have coordinated operations with them. And our relationship, the Indian army's relationship with the Myanmar army is really good. And uh, whatever Myanmar army is doing inside their country, they're definitely not creating a problem inside our country. And so also with us, we do help out the Myanmar army in getting rid of their uh, their insurgents who try and establish camps inside India. You have the Arakan army, the Arakam, Arakam, Arakan Liberation Army that you know that has come in once in a while, and we've thrown them out or handed them over to the uh, to to the to Myanmar. It's a complicated situation, uh, all in all, complicated in terms of tribes, complicated in the terms of the fact that it is open, complicated in terms of the fact that uh, there is a lot of uh, illegal trafficking, uh, illegal movement of equipment, drugs, uh, weapons, and everything. And of course, the fact that people on both sides are belong to the same uh, ethnic uh, group. And the state, of course, in which Myanmar is at the present moment. And as you know, Myanmar also borders the Golden Triangle. So uh, it, it's a difficult job. But uh, all I can say is a great deal of confidence is that India is no, under no potential threat there, no conventional threat there, and we've got it covered uh, at least in the along the Indo-Myanmar border. We we can do with much more equipment. We can do with many more forces. Uh, we can do with better roads. We can do with better education. But uh, at present, we we've got it covered, and there's no problem. Thank you.
Right, so actually, uh, as uh, I, I'll just ask you in continuation a question, which is that uh, suppose you were the DG Assam Rifles now, what would be your wish list to the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs and to the government as a whole for combating the situation in the regions? Uh, you know, I have actually been the DG of Assam Rifles. Yes. And I have represented the country in the national level meeting in, uh, in Mapidon, in Myanmar. And I have sat down with the Home Minister, who's a three-star general of the Burmese army. And we have discussed many such issues. You have to realize that across the 1,676 kilometers, there are only three Myanmar army units on the other side. So the jungle is largely, un, you know, it is not policed at all by the Myanmar army. And they depend on these insurgent groups to keep control of the, of the population there. And as a result, these insurgent groups live largely unsupervised lives in the jungles of Myanmar. So the first wish list would be, uh, and that we have taken to their, uh, you know, taken to them, is please, please bring in more forces, uh, start combing operations, throw out these people from there, and clean up these camps because the, this is the first problem. Then, unless Myanmar starts policing its borders, India doing it in absolute, uh, you know, as a single person as a single country can, cannot do this. So we need a force uh, equal to us that is there along the Indo-Myanmar border. And if we function together, uh, we, would, we would be very successful in uh, bringing this smuggling and bringing this uh, trafficking down to the minimum. That's the first issue, Angita. Second issue is uh, we know we cannot have a fence because of the, uh, the, the 16 kilometer free move regime there. But there is something called the smart or the virtual fence, uh, where we can utilize uh, existing technologies to monitor the movement of uh, people across. Uh, thirdly, would be uh, using the smart technology, we should be issuing uh, uh, the population on both sides of the border with RFID identity cards. And these RFID identity cards should be actually you know, in, our, in our database. So any time there is any movement, we should be able to identify who is coming and who is gone out. Uh, and Myanmar must, must agree to our request of issuing such identity cards to people in their side of the of, of the country, on their side of the Indo-Myanmar border. So, like I said, we might do it, but Myanmar has to do it along with us. Okay. So we need right. to bring in this technology. We need to create this smart or virtual fence. We need to bring in communication facilities. Uh, we need to bring in roads, uh, Sangeeta. We, we need to bring in uh, installations there. We need to bring in communication towers there. Uh, so my wish list is very large as far as this is concerned. But for the people, because there is no governance there, my wish list would also be that please bring in governance there. The border area uh, development fund, the BADP, uh, BADF, the border area development fund that is given by the Home Ministry, uh, is painfully less. And uh, you simply cannot do justice to the villages along the Indo Myanmar border. Uh, I wish there was less corruption. General Vinod Bhatia covered this fact that it is a very corrupt system. Uh, so, the, the development does not reach these people. And to survive, they have to join someone or the other. So unless we bring school, we bring colleges, we bring industry there, we give work to these people, and the large populations there understand that they are at a great advantage being with India, uh, this is a, going to be always a difficult job. Right, sir, absolutely. I think what you're saying is very, very correct. And it's, uh, you know, it's just a matter of looking into these things and this, there has to be a very strong relationship between the states and the center also in this case. Uh, General Bhatia, I would like to ask you. And also, about, Sangeeta, the, yes, sir? The, since you are covering this, there has to be a very strong relationship between India and Myanmar. Yes, absolutely. You, we have to understand how important Myanmar is to us. Uh, you know, our people don't understand this when they start beating their chest about various issues, 
you have to understand that Myanmar is more important to us than any other country right now. Myanmar and Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Myanmar and Bangladesh, all three countries with border uh, states of our, uh, in our Northeast are actually the most important states to us. We can hold Pakistan, there is no problem. But these three countries have, uh, you know, uh, there's no fence. There's no fence with Nepal and there's no fence with Myanmar. And we can't have a fence there. And how much can we fence and how much, how many more troops can we put there? So the, it's essential that diplomacy covers these issues. It's essential that the populations living on these borders are covered. And it's essential that we retain good relationship with people of these, these countries. We, we, will, we cannot live in isolation. And that's one issue that I've been constantly writing about that we must understand that good relations with Nepal, good relations with Myanmar, good relations with Bangladesh is doing us a favor, not them a favor. So our politicians right, have sir, to absolutely. stop, you know. That's All right, thing. sir. I think you're very right, sir. Absolutely. Uh, General Bhatia, uh, something we're taking from where, uh, you know, General Shaukin has left, that uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh are very important to us. I want to shift my focus to Bangladesh. So I'd like to understand from you why we're very happy that Bangladesh has somebody uh, leading it who is very pro-India at the moment. But then what happens after her? So uh, how, how are we in relationship with Bangladesh at the moment to keep our Northeast and eventually India stable? So I'd like you to uh, you know just throw some light on it, sir. I think Bangladesh uh, remains a challenge. Uh, we should not. But unfortunately, we have uh, had the the land border agreement, which has been implemented now after forty years delay. We still have issues of water uh, with Bangladesh. Uh, we share the longest border with Bangladesh, four zero nine six kilometers. So our longest land border is with Bangladesh, not with China. China about three four eight eight kilometers, and Pakistan three two two three kilometers. Right. So we have to understand that Bangladesh, and we have a connect with Bangladesh. The people. That, that connect, the cultural connect, uh, the language connect, the linguistic connect. Uh, you, you go to Bangladesh, uh, when you go there, it, it is not that. They, they do Durga Puja. Uh, the language is same, the culture is the same. But the fact remains that there was a time when our relations were very bad. Unfortunately, the Wami League government is, and we have uh, had reasonably very good relations with them. But we got to be sensitive to, to their needs. We are not able to resolve the Tista waters. You know, uh, there are uh, 56 rivers which flow into Bangladesh from India. So that's sort of what we are doing. So we, uh, we have to understand that Bangladesh is very important to us because that is uh, also our connect to the, uh, uh, you know, not only Northeast, but Act East also. If you want to Act East, you need a safe corridor. We need alternate routes uh, through Bangladesh. If you go to Tripura, I, I see no reason why we, we cannot uh, transit through Bangladesh. and then Bangladesh also. So I think uh, Bangladesh is uh, very important to us. And uh, we should invest in Bangladesh. We should understand their sensitivities and uh, we should help them out. And today Bangladesh is growing. It is, you know, we, we have fenced that nation. Honestly, we, that nation fenced on three sides. But today, uh, I, I think there, there is a time come when there will be reverse migration from the border areas. Because the Bangladesh is economically is growing as much as this thing. And, and the, 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 the defense in the Northeast region, especially, and Bangladesh, because they, they should absorb a lot of economic migrations. It's economic migration. I'm not talking about Rohingyas. That's, that's a separate issue. But economic migration will take place, which is not taking place much, uh, much now. So we have to understand that because of the development process in Bangladesh, so that has stopped. So we we'll, we we'll have to look at we got you know uh, with Bangladesh fortunately we have shared interests we have mutual concerns uh, we uh, have cultural linkages world civilization linkages uh, and they do they 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 they, they do are you know thankful to us for the liberation war uh, and we should recognize that their effort in the liberation war uh, we all think that all ninety seven war was on India well Bhakti Bhai played a major role in that. And the people of Bangladesh, uh, they play a major role in that. So we should take pride in that connect uh, between the two nations, uh, two people. And sir, in continuation, I'll continue with you, Bhatia sir, that uh, what, what do you feel 
is the relationship uh, we have with Bhutan and uh, Nepal, both very good friendly countries we had. Bhutan still continues to be nice and friendly, but we saw last two years Nepal, you know, changing very drastically in its stance towards India. And uh, we just wanted, wanted to just, uh, you know, have a word or two on that from both of you gentlemen, we'll begin with you, sir, that, uh, you know, we need to understand that what are the confidence building measures we need to have with these two countries, these two neighbors of ours. What I'll do, I'll, I'll take on Bhutan and uh, we have the Nepal expert. No, uh, it'll be incorrect for me to even try to speak on Nepal when Jain Shabin Johan is there. But he is the country's leading expert. Let me tell you, having read uh, about that, and I have, I have a feel on Nepal because I studied there in Nepal and I visited them with the DGMO. Uh, but the fact still remains uh, that uh, today, if I were to say, uh, uh, I would, I would say that Jain Shokin Johan is a leading expert on Nepal, so I'll leave that to him. As for Bhutan is concerned, I think uh, Bhutan uh, is very important to India, and India is very important to Bhutan. Uh, having been there and served there uh, along the border areas, Bhutan is the only country in the world to have fought someone else's war. Uh, we have the Indian insurgent troops, the camps were there. On 17th of December 2003, uh, the Royal Bhutanese Army uh, they went and they raided those camps, destroyed those camps, and forced them to. They evicted them from uh, from southern Bhutan, basically. So th that is someone who, which very few countries would do that. And thereafter, they have ensured and maintained that their territory is not used for the India, uh, uh, you know, uh, purposes, basically purposes. Look at uh, you know uh, the Dolom Plateau. Is a strategic concern for India because that Jamfari Ridge, Ridge overlooks uh, our Siliguri corridor. It, 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 it does avenue. It's not so easy. Uh, let me also say that it's not that just just because you know the PLA would come and sit on the on the Jamfari Ridge and everything is lost. No, it's not that. We we have our uh, we are very sure about it that it's, it's not going to be easy. But all the same, so we have a 2007 friendship treaty with Bhutan, the India-Bhutan friendship treaty. In section two of the friendship treaty, it is very categorical that the two nations will will ensure the security interests of each other, and that is where Bhutan and India requested us because Dolam is Bhutani state, right? China claims it, but it is Bhutani state. So that is how uh, when we talk of the Dolam standoff, we should understand that the standoff was in Bhutani territory at the request of Bhutan. So that is how important Bhutan is to us. It is not that. And people to people connect. The only exit from Bhutan is through Indian territories. All the roads which lead out to Bhutan. We have the border roads in Bhutan, which have been doing a wonderful job. We have a training team which, which does that. We train the Bhutanese army, the Bhutanese officers. Uh, we have uh, you know, uh, respect for each other. Uh, it is, uh, you know, Bhutan is very close to us. It's not that. And uh, well, let me say that uh, Indians are well respected in Bhutan. Uh, they're, they're well respected. We don't, we don't have a visa. And Bhutan is very high end tourism, very high end tourism. Uh, they charge, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they charge $100, $100 a day as a visa fee. If you're supposed to seven, uh, seven days, $700, which is not, no, no one can really afford it. But for Indians, uh, it's all there. So similarly, they, their exit also is all from India. So we have a very good connect between uh, not only people of India, but people of the region. You know, uh, people of Assam, North Bengal, they have an excellent connect with the people of Bhutan. And in southern Bhutan, we are the Bhutanese people. So wow. they have, uh, you know, uh, and so we have looked after uh, each other's security interests. When the when the Bhutanese issue came in, the, you know, they had the camp in, uh, uh, what is the name, uh, Zaba, Zaba, no? Zaba camp. So they went out, there were 1 lakh, 7,000 people were there at one time. So uh, I think, uh, uh, and uh, diplomatically also, if you look at it, uh, Indian uh, embassy in Bhutan, uh, most of their thing is uh, connected through the Indian embassy. They, they, the China, they have not opened up their diplomacy to China and other nations. There were very few embassies in Bhutan, Bangladesh and India. Right, sir. Absolutely, sir. It's, it's so nice to hear from, uh, you know, experts like you all about, you know, they, they are very positive stories which emanate. And, uh, you know, give a real nice feel to the people who are living on the borders of these countries. Uh, sir, uh, General Shokin, sir, uh, you know, General Bhatia has very categorically said that he's not going to talk about Nepal with you sitting on the panel. So, sir, uh, you know, we have centuries of relationship. 
and what's gone wrong with it sir? okay uh, firstly i thank jal bhatia for his kind words uh, i have done my phd in in the indo nepal relations uh, recently so it's a fairly recent phd uh, i was in the indian embassy too uh, as the as india's defense advisor but prior that i had uh, traveled extensively in nepal since i am from the gurkhas i speak four to five languages of there a uh, couple of uh, dialects there uh, now let me just take you on a small history trip uh, Bhup- uh, india and nepal are actually uh, one people we may be two separate nations but we are one people uh, historically uh, Uh, other than the people living in the upper regions of nepal that is the uppermost northern regions of nepal which have might have a uh, some kind of connect with the, the people of tibet the balance of the nepalis actually immigrated migrated uh, from india uh, we share the same religion we have had a wonderful relationship but at the same time i i must get you to you know if you visit the nepalis uh, uh if you visit nepal's uh, uh the foreign ministry and their uh, and the and the army headquarters on the as you enter you see uh, it written there that nepal is a yam between two boulders uh which actually uh, means that it's a small little country between two large larger countries uh the one in the north is obviously tibet and now china and the one in the south is india and nepalis consider themselves to be that yam so whenever we try and think that we are the most important uh you know most important to nepal you must keep in mind that nepal also borders tibet there are and they are much more vulnerable from the north than they are from the south because on the south they have india and india is not a country that covets their territory but in the north it's a much more difficult situation so when you have a thought process that we have to balance the relationship nepal will obviously never want to upset china that's the first issue you must understand in nepal's foreign policy that they will always want to balance us the second issue you must understand is that nepal has always moved to the most powerful state and this is historical in in the in the 17th century and the 18th century before the intervention of the british uh in the anglo nepal wars of 1814 to 1816 nepal was actually fighting uh, fighting both sides they were fighting in pithoragarh Ut- uttarakhand basically the uttarakhand state and they had come right up till the kangra fort but on the other side they were also fighting tibet and at that point when china intervened in the in the nepalese battle against tibet nepal actually had to accept chinese sovereignty and in the 17th century in 18th century the nepalese were paying tribute to the chinese emperor in beijing so it's not a situation of today sangeeta it's a situation of history it's a situation of a smaller country being caught between two larger countries after the british won the anglo anglo uh, nepal wars of 1814 to 1816 and we find they signed the treaty of sagoli we cut nepal and put her in between the the kali river and the 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 the, the mechi river the you know nepal became half its size but more importantly realized that the british was stronger than the chinese and therefore sided the british and stop paying tribute to the chinese in by after 18 1855 after the treaty of thapatani and supported the british in their uh, you know uh, in their forays into tibet young husbands foray into tibet the armed foray into tibet was supported by the nepalis because that time the nepalis were very clear that they would be protected by the british cut to 1947 48 mao wins the war in his own country the communists come to power one of the first statements of mao in 1950 is that nepal bhutan arunachal uh, tibet 
are like five fingers of the palm the, and the palm is actually china moment king mahender hears this he gets worried that just as the nepalese have will will take over tibet they might next take over nepal and when nepal does that they immediately contact india and say look we are in trouble please help us reorganize our army so i'm talking of 1854 i mean 1954 1959 king mahender comes we move the indian military mission to nepal uh, we have the mission there in 1966 67 but in between what happened we lost the war the border war against china once we lost this war the tables turned nepal realized that we can no longer now protect nepal if we can't protect ourselves how will we protect nepal and nepal then starts the issue of moving and changing the balance of power towards china so what you are seeing there sangeeta is an issue of this change of balance of power nothing has happened of course our our diplomacy has been not had not been good enough but most important is the fact that nepal doesn't feel we can protect it so she has to balance again and for that balance she has to go back to china and the moment china started the issue of the bri nepal realized that she can't say no to china she has to say yes so if you say yes to china then this is what china does they come in big and this is what it happens that the after the maoist revolution of uh, 2004 5 when i was i was a da in nepal during the second jan andolan and very quickly the situation changed it changed because the politics the color of the political parties the leadership in nepal changed before the king took over it was the nepal congress after the king handed over power Girija Koirala became the interim prime minister, but after that, in the elections, the Nepal Communist won. And in that, you had first Prachanda, then you had Babu Ram Bhattarai, and then you had K P Sharma Oli. All are communists. The larger, the largest political group is affiliated to the communists. So when you have somebody like that, then obviously in this yin yang of relationships, this is bound to happen. but we should keep our cool sangeeta my my basic thing is nepal needs us nepal knows she needs us she also knows she can do nothing without us they have realized in the earthquake in uh, in 2015 that it was the indian help that actually sustained them the chinese simply cannot reach but they will continue to play this foreign policy game because she realizes her survivability is at stake and this is the issue that i want our country to realize there is we must upgrade our diplomacy we must upgrade we must upgrade our knowledge we must treat nepal as a as a sovereign country and we must continue to give help to nepal because our 1770 km border is fully open and and unlike burma or myanmar nepal's sits on the head of the indo-gangetic plain probably the most strategic location in in the country today and the southern plains of nepal as she comes downwards as you come downwards are you can have no defensive lines india can have no defensive lines there there are no geographical features that can prevent anybody moving from nepal into india and it would require a huge amount of force to actually Uh, protect that part of our border so that's the issue uh, so, historically that's the issue politically that's the issue diplomatically and geographically these are all issues where uh, i'm sure the dgmo will agree with me on this issue uh, jalbatia <laughs> yeah, you know that is important to us and we actually border on nepal and we have linkages Uh, number of their you know uh, the ranas are uh, the, the royal families Let are married into us and like class yes then 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 related to us that sort of religion is one then uh, over the centuries the historical ties are there earlier what used to happen was that you know the nepalese preferred india as an education destination i am talking of the decision makers families 
but now no longer so they, they really go you know the us the uk are the destinations so then there is a change is happening but yes nepal has to if I, if i was a nepalese and um, uh, i think then shukin jo put it very right i would look after my interests and my interests are survival uh, they are between india and china they, they, they have to understand that china uh, can uh, play havoc there absolutely sir i think gentlemen it was so wonderful to speak with you and you know this is an endless topic absolutely and you know, we, we absolutely get absorbed and uh, i really would have wanted to continue but i'm sure you know that uh, we have we're going to have many more occasions when we sit and you know discuss more uh, issues regarding all the countries which we have with us bordering our northeast and uh, chetali is waiting in the cypress studios for us so that we can you know just go back and uh, you know have give her time she's just post her lunch and uh, we you know says i'll be very grateful uh, you know when the, to both of you that uh, next time whenever uh, there is an event and there is something which happens i'm going to absolutely disturb both of you with one subject which is very very near to my heart i'm sure to yours to chitali's and uh, which is the northeast of the nation sir so thank you very much sir thank you so much thank you both of you uh, general bhatia and general chauhan wonderful to have you with us thank you thank you it's an thank honor you. to be with general bhatia uh, in any show thank you so much thank you so much thank gentlemen you. i'm sure our audience are going to enjoy this conversation a lot this discussion that you both men had today uh, it seemed i mean you had immense knowledge about northeast about the challenges about everything that is happening there our audience are going to love to hear this thank you so much and we look forward to have you again in our chat room sometime soon thank you and have a great day ahead thanks ma'am thank you jain sir thank you and a very happy Bye. republic day sir to both Same of you thank you